When I was eight years old, I was hospitalized for several days with stomach aches that wouldn't go away. My parents feared appendicitis, but that was quickly dismissed based on the location of the pain. I was admitted to Children's Hospital where they ran a bunch of tests, all of which came back negative. No apparent physical cause for the pain. Now, at some point, the doctors must have begun asking my parents some different kinds of questions because in the end, my stomach aches, the doctors said, were stress-induced, apparently from conflict in my family. You know, looking back now, it's not too surprising, really. It was the mid-1970s. My parents were raising three ki six kids, three of whom were teenagers during those turbulent times. And with eight people around the same dinner table a couple of times a week, uh, we were sure to experience both the joy of a big family as well as the conflict. Now, I bet the Christians in Jerusalem, as reported in Acts 15, had stomach aches of their own. The conflict then was real, and it was among family and friends. And I'll bet there are some of you watching today that have stomach aches of your own, thinking about conflict in your own family, or among friends or neighbors or colleagues at work. It's hard to find an area in life right now where there isn't actual or potential conflict over any number of issues. So from the safe context of online worship, in the slower days of August before the madness of an election this fall, and as we navigate a pandemic with compassionate caution, I want to offer one observation and three suggestions about dealing with conflict, all based on the events of Acts 15, where the early church was beginning to spread its wings, even in the midst of real conflict. First, an observation about conflict. In most cases, the issue isn't the issue. For me, at eight years of age, a stomach ache wasn't coming from a physical ailment. It was rooted in conflict. But even that conflict at home revealed layers in which the issue wasn't the issue. The issue wasn't the issue in Jerusalem either. The early church was struggling with change. Conflict that stemmed from Mosaic laws about circumcision and dietary restrictions. But the issue inside the issue was really about who's in and who's out. At its core, the conflict in Jerusalem was about salvation, a, a conflict which tragically continues to divide the Christian church to this very day. Until we get to the real issues among us, to the heart of the matter, if you will, we will just spin our wheels around symptoms like stomach aches without getting to the diseases like family systems. Until we get to the issue inside the issue, we'll be stuck dealing with surface matters like religious rituals without getting to the core concerns like grace, unconditional love, and universal salvation. As you search your own heart for the points and places of stress and conflict, be sure to take an extra step back. Spend some dedicated time and really drill down to the core of the matter. I'm willing to bet that the issue on the surface, the presenting issue, isn't the real issue. Now, let's get to some practical ideas that we see at work in Acts 15 where the early church gives us a model to follow as we sometimes agree to differ, but always unite to serve and resolve to love. First, they came together. Now, don't underestimate the importance of simply coming together with others in times of conflict. Time and time again, while Jesus was with them and after his physical presence was gone, the followers of Jesus came together at the table, in homes, on beaches, on Pentecost. Remember that day in Acts? And it was Jesus himself who said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. I once heard of a church years ago dealing with conflict where they always left one chair at their meeting unoccupied 
as a physical reminder that in their coming together, Jesus was present. It was for them the Jesus chair. Now, of course, right now we're, we're dealing with a pandemic and living in a time when coming together is a challenge. So let me be really clear. A phone call or a Zoom meeting will not accomplish the same thing as being together face to face, even behind masks. So we have a challenge right now, but we must not let it dissuade us, especially because most conflicts can be reduced to being between just two people. And we can always find a way to sit with just one other person. And we must. It's a matter of respect and dignity and trust to do what the early church did and come together. So first, come together. Second, they were silent. As the discussion and debate ensued, the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says, the whole assembly kept silence. They listened. Peterson's translation that I just read, the message, says that there was dead silence. And then, the silence deepened. Can you imagine people actually silently listening to one another? I mean, was it, was it just good manners? Were they being polite? Was it because there were no microphones? I would submit to you that, that they were learning in real time what it means to be community. Led by the Spirit, they were demonstrating the essential nature and the wisdom qualities of silence. And as I say, probably way too often, show up and then shut up. Because the alternative is to talk, presumably to impose your beliefs or your ideas on other people who may or may not have asked for them. It was M. Scott Peck, the author of The Road Less Traveled, who said chaos is created when we try to heal, convert, or fix another. The work of healing, converting, or fixing is the work of God, my friends, born and raised in silence. Third and lastly, there was testimony. After they came together, and when there was silence eventually broken, it was broken by personal sharing, by people testifying to the work of God in their lives. The passage says, Barnabas and Paul reported matter-of-factly on the miracles and wonders God had done among the other nations through their ministry. It wasn't about believing in Jesus or believing about Jesus. It was a demonstration of believing Jesus. Giving testimony, it comes from the heart and, and it requires courage. The word courageous means from the heart. And the beauty of testimony is that it's never wrong. When truth discovered in experience is shared through the crucible of someone's heart, it is indisputable. And it brings the fresh air of the spirit to any conflict and, and helps move it toward resolution. I've become convinced that most often we act or live our way into new ways of thinking, not the other way around. And every time we get to hear heartfelt testimony from another person, we're given the chance to live and grow and learn and change through them. Too often it seems we live in the world of they, where silence is not broken by testimony, by personal experience being shared honestly, but instead silence is broken with words like, well, they say this or that, or they did such and such. This world of they is eating us alive right now. I can't help but think of Jesus and the disciples on the road to Capernaum. He asked them, who do people say I am? And they answered, they say you're John the Baptist or Elijah or others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. To which Jesus immediately replied, but who do you say I am? Testify for yourself. Stop pointing to others 
or deferring to the world of they. Search your own heart. Observe your own direct, personal experiences. And then with God's help and by the power of the Holy Spirit, give your testimony for the good of the world. Peter, Barnabas, and Paul, all in the Council of Jerusalem, told of all that God had done. They let their life speak. They gave testimony. And we can do the same. You know, I don't get stomach aches anymore, at least not from conflict. But right now, my heart aches. My heart aches over the conflicts I see all around me. My heart aches and my heart breaks because we can all do better than what we've been doing lately in facing real issues even legitimate conflict. So may we collectively acknowledge that oftentimes the issue isn't the issue. And then may we have the conviction to come together, the wisdom to hold silence, and in time the courage to give testimony. All for the glory of God. May it be so. Amen.